Hi, welcome to Introduction to Business Week 2. Uh, I'm going to be talking directly to you about uh, our topic, markets, and particularly what's the relationship between markets and business and uh, how we understand economies as a whole. Uh, so you'll have the slides. Uh, you do have the slides by the time you're watching this. And I uh, will speak to a printout of my slides here. I will speak we'll do this as a number of modules and I'll add some extra material subsequently to explain the particular issues. Um, I'd like to go and talk straight away about my second slide here which is entitled Who is in Charge? And this is a really important point because human beings are very hardwired to think in terms of who is in charge, who is in control, who's making decisions. This is a, a basic human instinct. We want to be in control of our, of our world around us, of our physical world, our material world, our social world, but very often we don't have control. One of the really striking things, of course, about the COVID-19 pandemic is it revealed to people how you can have the best laid plans, you can be completely organized, you can work for a highly organized company, uh, or an organization, everything can be laid out and then suddenly we're hit by things beyond our control. And coping with that lack of control can be a challenge. Particularly if one tends to be a little bit uh, of a nervous di uh, disposition, we tend to be a little bit uh, anxious, worried that uh, we may be buffeted by things that we can't control. Those who are much more relaxed and people from a cultural background with, uh, who are relatively content with just letting things be, maybe are less concerned with that impulse to control. You know, control deeply is tied to what we call agency, our sense of our individual capacity to change the world, to control the world, of course, to impact on the world in predictable ways and to respond effectively to what the world throws uh, up at us. So when we talk about market systems, um, immediately this issue arises of who is in control. Now, many critics of capitalism, of business, tend to speak of big business, of powerful big businesses, and suggest that a few faceless people in the boardrooms or the CEO offices of large companies are somehow controlling the system. And a lot of our discourse, a lot of the stories we talk about how society works, about how business works, tends to reduce it to images of a machine. And a machine implies that someone is in control. We have a system or we have a system of systems, which is a slightly more sophisticated version of it. And the implication here is that somehow people should be in control of the system. It should be accountable. The system should work for us. Now, when we speak about a market system, it's great strength, but also what I think is so terrifying for many people about market systems is that actually no single person is in control. The government is not in control of it. Government sets important conditions uh, within which markets uh, proliferate or don't, um, which often has its own problems. Uh, but it doesn't control the actions and can't even begin to control the actions of a huge array of participants in a market system. So I'm going to say explicitly that the beauty of a market system rests in the fact that there is nobody in control. That's not to say that the system is out of control. It's one thing to say there is no single person in control. It's another thing entirely to say that somehow the system is out of control. That rather, very much like our natural ecologies, the natural world, that there tends to be equilibrium. We tend to arrive at certain healthy balances unless we're buffeted by some major external shock. And that this is the great strength of the system because it allows the system to be relatively flexible. So, of course, we all know that market systems and capitalism are associated with self-interest. 
But what's really striking with market systems is that it works both because of self-interest and also despite self-interest. So the people are out there looking to promote their own interests, but the system works in such a way that self-interest ultimately serves on balance collective and individual welfare. Uh, very famously, Adam Smith, the great pioneering Scottish economist, said it wasn't the uh, love of his fellow man that got the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker um, out of bed early in the morning to carry out their trade. Uh, it was self-interest. They needed to get up, to go to work, uh, in order to earn a living, in order to make money, uh, to do the things they want to do, to care for their family, to provide education for their kids, to enjoy the good life, uh, to pay for medicine uh, if they fall ill, for example, uh, maybe to donate to a charity that they, uh, they care for. So self-interest motivates people to meet the needs of others. This is the basic logic of a market system. And in order to continue to earn income, to do all those other things we want to do in life, to pursue our conception of the good, uh, we need to engage in mutual adjustment. And in the uh, reading for this week, Charles Lindblom, a very famous scholar of markets, of politics, of, of enterprise, and the relationship between market and politics in particular, has very much emphasized this notion of mutual adjustment. If you go into a marketplace, let's say you get up early and you go to the flower market, there's about four different flower markets in Tokyo. You want to buy nice flowers because you're a florist. You need them either to do your floral arrangements, which perhaps you provide to companies and stores. Perhaps you run a florist, honey or son, and you're going to on-sell these flowers to your customers, plus also do some flower arrangements um, out of the store. So you want the best flowers you can get at the best possible price. So you're going to go to the market. Uh, you'll often establish long-term relationships because you go every couple of days to the market because flowers don't last. You have to keep buying those flowers. The florist I go to fairly regularly of late um, at Yotsio, she says that she's been working with the same sellers in the markets now for several decades so that she doesn't actually need to go to the market anymore. She can just call them up and she can have very good products sent to her at a reasonable price. Now the buyer and the seller there will mutually adjust to each other's expectations. They have price expectations. Of course the seller would like a higher price, the buyer would like a lower price. Uh, but there's also issues of quality. And then there's always this zone of negotiation that uh, the flowers may not be in their best condition, uh, but you don't really mind if you get them cheap enough. Now, we always want the best possible thing for, for, for the money, but it's about cost, per, cost performance. And so it's going to be a trade-off. One of the uh, interesting ways I think uh, we can get our minds around this notion of, notion of mutual adjustment is just to imagine navigating through public transport systems. That when you're walking through a crowd, we are going through a process of constant micro mutual adjustment. We sense that people in front of us are speeding up or slowing down. Someone's trying to get across in front of us perhaps because they have to go to a subway exit, uh, which is to the right. Maybe someone's coming uh, from the opposite direction. Um, we sense perhaps someone coming towards us needs a bit more space. Maybe they're a little bit physically challenged. Maybe they're drunk. We want to get out of their way. So this, this ability to mutually interact. And it is truly a miraculous thing, if you think about the, uh, the normal rush hour, for example, in Shinjuku, that so many people can transit through what is really quite a mess in terms of a physical space and actually not bump into each other. And when people bump into each other, uh, it is so surprising precisely because we are so, so good at this mutual adjustment, adjustment. Now, that also gives us some hints as to many of the challenges of taking work and study online. 
when we start talking to a camera, anticipating that some time later, some people are going to be watching the consequences. We don't have any of the feedback mechanism. We don't get those uh, eye rolls, those subtle movements of the head, or whatever it is that people do, which suggests that they either disagree with us or they're not following the point. So we are constantly self-adjusting in response to very subtle reactions in our social interactions. Small children learn to do this very quickly. Um, they need to. They are fundamentally dependent on adults to raise them, to care for them, to provide them their most basic needs. And adults potentially can also be a threat to them, not just through neglect, but someone who's in a, who's in a bad way uh, emotionally. And children will know to, to flee and to protect themselves. So it is hardwired into us to be very alert to the feedback from others. We're good at mutual adjustment for the most part face to face. Once we reduce our interactions to just an email interaction, a text-based interaction, for example, it becomes much more difficult to read the nuances. So although the modern technology makes it seemingly exciting that we can collaborate with people from all over the world, uh, the inherent dynamics of face-to-face -face business and that nuanced mutual uh, adjustment that, that we undertake is a challenge in a virtual age. Eventually, as the technology gets better and better, the resolution of Zoom gets better, for example, um, they will be less of an issue. Now, in terms of really basic business issues, just a simple point. For every buyer, there is a seller. Okay, and for every seller, there is a buyer. That sounds obvious to state. Um, both people come to the transaction, you know, looking for maximizing their own interests, but ultimately it's a win-win situation. Very simply put, uh, if I buy something at a certain price, the seller values the cash over the particular thing that they sell to me. So the critical thing here is that all transactions rest on an asymmetry, an asymmetry of values. So if I could sell this, <laughs> um, simply it would be because someone else would value the information that's written here um, more than whatever price that I put on it. I'd like to think I could sell it for a high price. Um, that's not the way we work. We, we charge you up front to get into university, then you just have to cop it, I'm afraid. And it's more of a command system rather than a uh, spot market, and I will talk about that in a moment. Now, while it's generally win-win in f completely free markets when we have freely participating parties, under some conditions it can be exploitative. Some people are rather more powerful than others, and they can coerce people. So we shouldn't really think of that as business. We should think of it as crime. If it's a shakedown, you know, if the mafia comes along, um, comes by your bar, your club, your fish and chip shop and says, I think you want to make a donation to our organization, then that's coercion. You're simply being threatened to pay. So we shouldn't think of that in terms of business, uh, in business terms. There are a lot of gray areas uh, when a company becomes absolutely dominant, when there are no other sellers of the particular thing you want, uh, or no other buyers of the thing you want, then you can run into real problems of being exploited. Uh, by the way, in terms of basic, basic terminology, when a company is dominant, it is the dominant seller. We speak of monopoly, I think, as you all know. The game is named after that, monopoly. Okay, um, Monopsony is when you only have um, uh, one buyer in the market. So monopoly is when you have a dominant seller in the market, and monopsony is when you have a dominant buyer in the market. And that's a common problem, for example, if you have fragmented producers. So if I have a small dairy farm and I'm making milk, and I have to sell my milk every single day because the milk will go off, of course. 
and there's only one supermarket chain to buy it, they're an incredibly powerful position. And so what we do see is governments creating a lot of rules about fair competition to try and make sure that companies don't take advantage of their relative market strength. And we'll come back to that when we talk about issues of governance. At this point, I want to stay much more focused on um, the nature of a market system. So I pose a question, you know, what makes a good coffee shop in the lecture notes? And that's something we can, we can talk about uh, when we do an interactive session. But obviously it's product, it's performance, it's place, it's a whole range of things uh, in addition to the coffee. In some cases, the coffee can be terrible, but the, stop, the coffee shop can still do quite well as a business. So in our next interactive session, we'll, we'll throw this over to you and, and ask you to think about, you know, what does make a good coffee shop? What are you looking for there? Okay, let's talk a little bit about the nature of cooperation. This is our fourth slide. So as I say in the notes, cooperation is not just linear, but multilateral. What that means is we're cooperating with a whole range of people across a wide range of dimensions. We often speak about the linear cooperation when we talk about a certain product um, coming to market. Let's run with coffee. So, of course, you've got coffee bean growers in uh, many places in the world. Um, one of my very favorite coffees comes from Papua New Guinea, uh, a type called uh, Shigure. Shiguri uh, in, the, in Katakana, um, in the Papua New Guinean highlands. So you get the growers of the coffee. You then, of course, see the, the people who run the coffee plantations employing people because they simply can't maintain an entire coffee plantation by themselves. So there are performances there. There are transactions, a win-win relationship with someone who has the coffee plantation in New Guinea. They hire people to work for them, to tend the coffee trees, uh, the harvesting, for example, later on the, the initial processing of the coffee beans. Then, of course, the coffee beans have to be packed. They have to be shipped. Uh, let's say they get to Tokyo. Now they might very likely be roasted here in Tokyo. It's better for the coffee beans to be kept raw and then roasted just before you want to use them. Indeed, there are some nice... Um, roasteries now here in Tokyo, which will roast your beans to order. Yanaka coffee is one that stands out. It's incredibly good just to sit around outside and smell your coffee beans roasting, and you can have them roasted to order. And it really does make a difference to have them freshly, freshly roasted. But of course, uh, there are lots of uh, professional roasters who are doing interesting things, and then supplying restaurants, supplying a whole bunch of retail stores, for example, with the roast coffee. So a chain of people adding value. Eventually the roasted coffee ends up in the cafe. It's ground, of course. The barista makes the coffee. Uh, the uh, coffee is delivered typically by the waiter, uh, perhaps the barista directly in a small place, to the customer. So a lot of people involved, and we can think of that as a value chain way back uh, the starting point with the coffee and all of those other things, the machine and everything else um, that is involved in the process. And we see boutique companies specializing in just a very small part of that process. Um, for example, in Japan, uh, several boutique companies that make coffee grinders, who make hand pour uh, coffee instruments, so the filter papers and whatnot, even with proprietary technologies, all of these add value, which lead then to a good coffee experience at the end. Now, none of these performances are, in the words of Lindblom, random, accidental or coincidental. Uh, they're deliberate. People are doing this on a regular basis. This is their business endeavor. This is how they earn their living. And when there is disruptions, it's shocking. We've seen several disruptions over the last decade. We saw with the uh, 311 disaster here in Japan, the triple disaster, the um, 
of course, we had the uh, earthquake, then the tsunami, and then, of course, we had the, uh, the radiation problems with Fukushima that led to a whole range of issues, a, a range of knock-on effects. And that reminded consumers, ironically, of how incredibly stable market systems are. Suddenly, things that were just normal in terms of their availability were not available. Suddenly, there was difficulty in getting milk. Now, why was it difficult to get milk? Um, the disaster didn't affect cows directly. The milk supplies were disrupted by the very simple fact that um, several major factories in Tohoku were disrupted. And that those factories made basic key inputs. One of them made uh, the bottles and the caps for milk that was delivered in larger containers, so for commercial applications. More significantly, a lot of paper packaging, particularly the Tetra Pak type um, packaging, and by the way, Tetra Pak is actually, uh, it's a Danish brand, and they are here in Japan and they do manufacture, but there are other companies who use both the technology and other technology. Those kami pak, the paper packs in which milk come, comes, there was lots of manufacturing of that in Tohoku. And so the disaster disrupted that. So effectively what you had was milk producers, dairies, who they were producing the milk. Cows need to be milked every day. There were customers who wanted it. But the product couldn't get to the customers just simply for want of a certain kind of packaging. So there are so many points of value adding and any single one of those key inputs, when it's lacking, can be deeply disruptive. And we see this in a, in a whole range of industries. It's particularly striking, for example, in the creative industries. If you're making a movie, uh, you can have everyone there. But um, if the camera technician sleeps in, then it doesn't matter that you've got Brad Pitt and other A-list actors standing by and everyone else and the sandwiches and everything there, that if someone who knows how to use the camera isn't on site, then you don't make a movie. Okay, so we talk about the humdrum versus the creative inputs in the creative industries. But this is vitally important. So there is actually great predict predictability in market systems. You know, the cameraman makes sure to get out of bed and get to the shoot on time. Because in the, in the famous Hollywood expression, you'll never work again in this town if you get it wrong. Okay? Reputation becomes an incredibly important asset. You have a reputation for being a reliable supplier, a reliable performer, delivering your performance, adding value, so that then other people can add value as well. And this leads to predictability in the delivery of products in a capitalist system. So we can think of what most of us do in a modern market system as really providing specialized performances. And this is the language that Lindblom uses. It's, it's a little bit surprising as a language. We tend to think of performance as being on stage, being an actor or whatever. I'm performing now, although in front of a camera, not in front of a live studio audience, uh, as, in a, as in a classroom, but this is what we do. Of course, some people still make phys physical products. What's very clear, though, is the very fact that so much of our economy has been able to go online with the COVID-19 pandemic shows that uh, only a minority of people now are actually in the business of making physical products. So much of what we do is knowledge-based value-adding that in some sense couldn't be understood as a performance. So when we think about markets in general, what we're seeing is that they have evolved over time. They have a range of underlying physical properties in the sense that they are tied to places and historically that was much more important than it is today. Again, the pandemic shows that actually uh, much of what we do in business uh, doesn't need to be connected to a physical place anymore. 
And this is going to be one of the really interesting sets of issues that arises in a uh, post-COVID pandemic um, capitalism. We already have seen, for example, that uh, the trading floors of stock exchanges, such as the Tokyo Stock Exchange, has been completely done away with. It's all virtual now. And that actually there is really no reason for anyone to be at the Tokyo Stock Exchange um, in uh, Nihonbashi. That actually that can happen virtually and does happen virtually from pretty much anywhere. So in the next section, I will talk about uh, how market systems can work as a peacekeeper. My point up until now, just to simply summarize, has been that market systems have evolved to such a high level of sophistication. We take their existence for granted. They bring a great deal of stability to our day-to-day -day lives. And even when we see the shutdowns of the COVID-19 pandemic, what is really striking is the remarkable degree of continuity. We can still get most of the things we want relatively easily. And insofar as working styles have had to change, people have adjusted because they have an incentive to adjust. And market systems empower us, reward us for making that adjustment but also they punish us if we don't make those adjustments. And we are seeing that there will be, and there already are, um, quicker victims of the pandemic, simply those companies that haven't been able to respond rapidly to the operating difficulties that we face. Many of the reasons why some companies get hit harder, harder than others in the same sector is that ultimately they didn't embrace the technologies, the way the world was changing. Um, in recent years, they were putting off those decisions, for example, about automating uh, business systems, about creating decent IT systems, allowing their, their, their staff to have more working flexibility, basic things like being able to access data remotely, all of those kind of things that companies that are well run have been trying to do for a decade at least, that which put them in a relatively good position when you suddenly get hit by a dramatic change in the operating environment. And as I touched on in our first class, ad adaptive efficiency, this notion from Douglas North, adaptive efficiency is critical. So mutual adjustment in terms of people day-to-day -day interacting within a market system. And then when we do have what we call exogenous shocks, shocks from outside the system in some way or another, can be technological change, for example, the ability of, partner, of parties to adapt to those changes mutually adjusting so that they are win-win dynamics and allow business as usual, even if so many of the ways that business is done are very decidedly unusual viewed historically.